again. <laughs> um, right, I'll scoot through this because we're a little bit over time. Uh, so the purpose of this talk really, it harks back to my time as a, as a real museum curator in a real museum. Best job I've ever had. And uh, at Southampton, we, for the first time, did this, sorry, Claire. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> but not necessarily the best people. <laughs> um, yes, so what I wanted to do really was explore how, and this is a bit of a half-baked research project, but um, sort of look into how um, prehistory is shown in different museums beginning with Southampton Museum and our attempts to, to display the, the prehistory collection from Southampton. There's the museum, God's House Tower. Well, that's what it was. Uh, it's not an, an archaeology museum anymore. Um, that closed just after I left. Uh, I don't think the two events are related. And uh, it's, well, it's, as you can see, not a purpose-built museum. Uh, there was a temporary exhibition gallery alongside uh, three permanent galleries showing finds from the Roman, Saxon and medieval towns of Southampton, all in different locations. Uh, and our collecting area, basically bounded by the motorway um, and uh, Southampton water. So it incorporates three historic towns uh, and then a wider area, suburban area, uh, from which most of the prehistory is derived. Uh, that was the, uh, those two cases which uh, fronted the temporary exhibition gallery um, through that door uh, were where the prehistory had been previously displayed in a rather sad sort of arrangement of a few flints, uh, a few flint tools. Uh, accompanied by some very 1980s <coughs> feminist graphics, um, which are not unwelcome because those, those are probably the best things in the whole display um, until we got to the Neolithic when it all got a bit nuclear family. Um, and the great mistake of having fish, apparently no yet fish in the Neolithic. Uh, so that's a, a mistake. Um, and that I think is Matt Garner, one of our uh, diggers at the time. Um, <laughs> the collection itself, uh, I'm sorry Emma, we have quite a lot more hand axes, <laughs> um, includes Paleolithic stone tools, there's a Mesolithic working floor that was excavated in the 90s by the river, um, uh, there's some Neolithic pottery, uh, not very displayable. Uh, but some m much finer Neolithic stone implements, including polished stone axes. Uh, there's a bronze hoard. That's about the whole of the bronze hoard, top left there, and a couple of other random finds. But we do cover um, pal staves and socketed axes, so much of the Bronze Age period is represented. We have cremation urns from a barrow out towards the west of the city. Um, uh, and we have Iron Age loom weight from excavations in the medieval town. Uh, some Middle Iron Age pottery that was found towards the uh, west of the city. And of course, apparently, uh, every museum in the country has got at least one gold Iron Age stator. I didn't realise that until I went to a treasure meeting earlier in the year. Um, they're very common, apparently, which is why they're not included as treasure in the current revamp of the Treasure Act. There you go. Uh, we've only got one, obviously, <laughs> but apparently in parts of the country, they're really common. Um, so, that was it. That's, that's, it's not a very unusual collection, it's not a huge collection, and it had never been put together in one exhibition before, showing the whole of Southampton's prehistory. So we were breaking new ground. Um, and initially, so this sort of summarises what we've got, with the periods to the left there, and the types of sites present um, uh, and locally and regionally. So we've got a couple of barrows, but you know they've got 
Stonehenge in other parts of the region and things like that. So we didn't have a lot to go on, very little in terms of structure. It really is just objects. So initially we had to play around with, and if we'd done it chronologically, this was the challenge, we'd have had lots of hand axes, hardly anything Mesolithic, hardly anything Neolithic, uh, and a fair bit, and some Bronze Age stuff and some Iron Age stuff. It just would have looked completely unbalanced. That was the problem that we had. So we had to find a different way of approaching the topic. And we played around with all sorts of ideas. So this is one that we tried out, trying to relate it to the elements and um, how those really affected the development of prehistoric society from the Paleolithic to uh, the end of the Iron Age. Uh, but it didn't work. We just couldn't make the collection fit this crazy <coughs> idea, um, although we quite liked it. Um, so in the end, we came up with three themes. And these were accompanied by one or two cases that showed that theme throughout the whole, ex throughout the whole of the prehistoric period, from the Paleolithic to the Iron Age. The first theme was technology. Uh, and you can see, so we had stone working, we had bronze making, we had iron working, we got some iron slag, that isn't Iron Age, but doesn't change that much, does it? And um, uh, um, and so we put, we worked all that together. And here you can see our system of colour coding. So out, throughout the whole exhibition, we colour coded each period with the Paleolithic dark green, a lighter green for the Mesolithic, um, a yellowy green for the Neolithic, then a golden colour for the Bronze Age and red for the Iron Age. So that was the thing that guided you through the cases to establish the periods that people were looking at. The second theme was settlement and society, uh, from hunter-gatherers through to Iron Age nucleated settlements. And there you can see the, that this occupied the whole of the back wall of the exhibition, uh, from the Paleolithic to the, the left there through to the Iron Age at the end, and we had a, an ard that we put in as well to show ploughing. Uh, so we tried to explore those themes of, of the introduction of agriculture and domestication and all of that uh, with our limited collection. And then the third theme, third theme was magic and mystery, um, which, uh, which we explored with uh, the cremation urn, um, uh, we had a broken Bronze Age rapier from, recovered from the river. Uh, we had polished stone axes. We had things that we don't understand, essentially, and explored those themes uh, throughout uh, the prehistoric period as far as we could. Accompanying that, we had at the front of the thing our... We didn't have, go for a timeline. We went for a, a, a dendrochronological approach showing the, um, the different periods, introducing the idea of the, of the colour coding um, and accompanying those of these wooden tablets which had information about, about the, um, and they too were colour coded as you can see, had information about uh, what was happening in southern England at the t time in at that particular period and then what was happening in the rest of the world. So we could put the prehistory of southern England into context somehow, if anybody wanted to read them. And the idea was that you read them together, really. It was orientated towards families so that they could explore these things uh, together. Uh, we had a, some interactives. How many hand axes are in this case? Anybody want to guess? <laughs> <laughs> the idea obviously was to show just how the hand axe was used as a sort of throwaway implement that could be knocked up uh, whenever you needed it and that's why we find so many of them. Uh, the answers under that flap was 101 in case you're interested. We had a touch screen uh, with, a ver with a number of things. There was a film of somebody flint napping. You can't do it without a film of somebody flint napping. Um, you've got, uh, unless you actually have somebody flint napping. Um, we, so this is designed to show interactive maps of the city 
and where these things were found and how the river gravels produced most of the Paleolithic objects um, and a lot of the, the Bronze Ages bar barrows out on the city margins and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and we also had our Paleolithic diner which uh, included um, this interactive uh, you're supposed to make, a, make a, a dish using only foods that were available during the Paleolithic period. I think there was an Iron Age one as well. So obviously no potato, no pineapple, that sort of thing. Um, and then we had some Stone Age recipes to go along with that. Um, so uh, see 101 mammoth recipes. Um, so that was it. That was the that was our attempt at making the most of a pretty limited collection, effectively. Um, so, having gone through all that, uh, the ex exhibition was, uh, we thought it was great. <laughs> it was very popular. Um, so I'm just going to compare that with, um, with a couple of other exhibitions that I've researched recently to see what they do with similar collections. So this is Barbican House in Lewis, in Sussex, where I first started as a volunteer in 1974. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was 16. Um, uh, so it was nice to go back there and uh, meet Emma, the curator again. Uh, she wasn't the curator when I started there. <laughs> um, uh, this is the prehistory gallery at Barbican House. Uh, it's probably a smaller space than we had um, and a much smaller budget. Our exhibition cost about £8,000, I think, and we redid some of the lighting. We had all those cases made speci specifically for it. Um, uh, and we had a, but then we had an, an on-site technician. The museum service had a technician in those days and a photographer, so we could do the graphics and, an in, and our own exhibition designer. Um, we have all those, had all those things that people we were working with. Um, it would cost much, much more than that without those people in-house. Uh, but you tell that to museum managers these days. Anyway, um, so Barbican House, uh, Sussex, the Sussex, the Museum for the Sussex Archaeology Society, a collection from the whole county. Um, they've explored this uh, using a thematic approach, using here um, materials. So there's stone, there's flint, there's bronze, there's iron. Those are the sort of, they, it's not entirely chronological, but it is around the technology, I suppose. Uh, and then there's two more cases on pottery and textiles. And they've tried to literally weave the story of the development of, of Sussex prehistory through those uh, themes. And you can see potentially there's county maps showing where the main sites are. Uh, there's a, this sort of is the interactive where you can um, do whatever you do with the QR code, scan it, and um, it'll tell you more information. Uh, and there's also a county map showing you fine spots and things like that. That's pretty basic, and that's 15 years old, and the curator is, was telling me that really she needs to redo that, but they just need more space. There, there isn't the room to do much more. You can compare that with uh, the new prehistory gallery at Brighton Museum, uh, which opened this year, uh, called Our Ancestors. Um, if you, it, it's, it's arranged chronologically from Ice Age through to, well actually through to the Saxon period. Um, and, uh, but so it covers all of the prehistory within the Brighton Museum collecting area. Uh, you can see how it's laid out. They're, they've got human remains virtually in every, for every single period, uh, which is quite brave these days. Um, and there's a notice on the door that says, this exhibition contains human remains. Um, please treat them respectfully, respectfully and don't take any photographs of them, which I didn't read until I was leaving the gallery. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
And one of the skeletons actually is of a, a pregnant woman and her unborn infant, which is really quite brave. Um, but seemingly not a problem. Uh, the children, I'll show you in a minute. The children, um, so the, 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 each period is arranged um, in this sort of way. You've got uh, some human remains. You've got a reconstructed face of an individual. They've tried to, they've tried to sort of individualize it, tell the story of a person. Um, you've got objects which characterize the period. This is the Iron Age, so they've got some gang, slave gang chains, um, as if that's really typical of the Iron Age. Maybe it's typical of the Iron Age in Brighton, I don't know. Um, and they've all got um, sort of video at the, uh, in, as well, film showing Again, somebody making a flint hand axe, somebody making fire, somebody making pots, etc., etc. Um, and it's all around that. And then they include the story of Ella, uh, this character who's Ella in the Paleolithic, Ella in the Mesolithic, Ella in, in what she's doing. Uh, it's quite clever. Uh, oh, there she is. Um, Elva, sorry, in the Iron Age. So she's running away before she gets caught and turned into a slave. Um, one thing I do like is that there are interactives spread out around it. This is a mystery object. Uh, I think it's Neolithic. And you're, you can vote for what you think it, <laughs> what you think it actually is. Now, which I didn't realize. I was just pressing loads of buttons waiting <laughs> for something to happen. So I voted for everything several times. Uh, it's a bit like what it's going to be like on the 12th of December. Um, so I think that's quite, a good, uh, that's quite a good idea. I quite like that. But they could actually tell you more explicitly what you're supposed to do before you start pressing buttons. Um, and this is the, this is the campfire. Uh, and the, the, the sort of interactive for, for small children is to, is to construct a human skeleton, which I think basically is a quite a good way of approaching the fact that they've got human remains on display. Uh, and certainly, um, oh, and there's the, the, the notice, certainly children were doing that, really, and really, little children really getting into it. So uh, it seems to work. So those are the two, you know, it's interesting to compare those two. It's interesting that they've gone for such a chronological approach. They've thrown an awful lot of money at that. Lots of video and film. Um, lots of nudie lighting, those facial reconstructions are not cheap. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting contrast to Barbican House, for sure, uh, and certainly to what we were trying to do in Southampton. But to return to the question of my talk, uh, one of the things that exercised us when we were planning the prehistory exhibition in Southampton was uh, whether what to call it and whether to go for uh, to, to, to go for talking about BC or BP or, or what um, and it's an interesting question to think about and actually looking at different museums you see different things going on even here in the greatest cinematic anachronism of all time um, you've got two different um, ways of putting it. You've got one million years ago or one million years before Christ. You haven't even put BC. Um, and I don't know whether there's a right answer or a wrong answer. I've gathered a few other examples. So top left Novium uh, in Chichester. Uh, this is, it, it, just, it just goes BC AD. And the curator there was telling me that that just seemed to be the simplest way of getting people to understand what is meant. Uh, in Lewis at Barbican House, they've got a sort of time column uh, in the middle of the room that again goes for um, BC and AD. At the Ashmolean in Oxford, that object, although there's no text that says BC, the objects are still um, dated BC or AD. This is the BBC website to accompany the Key Stage 2 curriculum uh, activities. Uh, 
And they try to avoid it as much as possible, but can't help themselves going 3,500 BC. Uh, and at Brighton, in the new gallery, there's no distinction at all. And it's just 6,000 years ago, um, which is easily understood, as easily understood it should be as BC or AD. The problem really for us in Southampton was um, was the same thing, whether or not we should go for that um, and make it, because we thought people understood what we mean by BC. Because the whole exhibition was just about prehistory, trying to, um, trying to incorporate any other way of putting it seemed difficult for us. And it, but it wasn't until I was listening to somebody on the radio, I think it was, or reading an interview with the leader of a Muslim community in London, and he was asked what his thoughts were about the, the term BC and AD. And he said, to be honest, there are far more important things for me to be worrying about. <laughs> and I took that as a, as, as a, as a, <laughs> as a good reason to, to, to follow the same line. So in the end, we went to the complete extreme of calling the exhibition BC, <laughs> just to make clear what it, is, what it was about. And I don't think there is, a, there is a, a, a better way of expressing that you are just discussing a prehistory, certainly in a British context. Uh, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs>